Hello, everybody. Um, I'm just going to wait a couple more minutes for some people to arrive to the webinar. Uh, today, we're talking about approaching your investors. Um, we were meeting yesterday about um, the, the class yesterday, which we were talking about for, well, the first one we were talking about hiring and training, which directly led into how to work with a manufacturer for your food business. And then this one that we're talking about today is how to approach investors. Um, we are not gonna take the full time. I'm gonna leave some time at the end just because it's Friday and I'm sure everyone um, wants to finish up early. But then aside from that, really approaching your investors, um, we're gonna talk about a few strategies and it's not gonna take a full hour and a half. So if you have any questions, We'll put it on the chat, um, but I'm just going to wait two more minutes for more people to join us. All right, so I think it's safe to get started. Um, so just again, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming for the Dreaming Out Loud. Uh, webinar series or workshop series that we're doing for food businesses. Um, this is the last of the series. And um, well, thank you for joining me through the series. Uh, something that I will ask in every class is just that we are developing different food boot camps. So if you have any um, subject matters or any questions that you want answered or addressed, then we would be happy to do or design a class um, around that. Um, I just need to be aware of what it is that you're looking for. But as far as food businesses go, I tried to keep the information um, pretty generalized for different types of food business. But I believe that this, this types, um, the subject matters that we chose apply to most of you, um, or will apply to most of you, especially as you write your business plans. Um, today, we're talking about approaching your investors. And in approaching your investors, there's a lot of things that you really need to um, think about. But I also um, hope that as you write your business plan, it allows you to develop confidence to approach your investors in a very um, deliberate way. And the reason I say that is because a lot of the time I see people a little bit shy to approach people who are potential investors. And the importance of being able to be confident about your, your product or your service or your concept, it's extremely important. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that as well. But ultimately, I want you to remember that you, by approaching your investors, you're actually doing a sales pitch to them about your business. So you're selling them the belief and, and, and the confidence that your business is going to be successful. So usually so that they can make a return on their investment. So because of that, um, I always go back to the vision and make sure that I mean, like the first uh, episode, I guess, or the first subject that we covered in this webinar series was about developing your concept and your vision. Um, and it's always important to go back to that, especially as you approach investors and you find out what their vision is as well. Um, what's their vision with your, with your concept? Are they planning to be long-term involved partners or 
do they just want to invest and then recoup their money and get out? Um, that happens, actually. Um, it depends on your scenarios and who you're, you've developed a relationship with. But ultimately, your investors are going to be people who you have developed some sort of relationship with that they can trust you um, enough to invest in your business. And that's not just an individual, but also banks and programs and grants. Um, you're going to have to instill trust. So today we're talking about approaching your investors. Um, thank you again to Capital One and Nourish DC for this webinar series. Um, this webinar series is being sponsored by Capital One and Nourish DC. And on top of that, Capital One and Nourish DC are offering a grant. And the grant I've already included and shared with everybody uh, multiple times, but the grant is um, $500,000 that they're putting into our economy. And it's going to be between $10,000 and $50,000 that you can apply for. And you just have to meet the criteria that um, they have listed on their website. So I just stopped my share because I'm going to put in um, the, the links that you need for your to be able to um, access the grant. So the first link I'm going to share with you is where you're going to be able to get updates about um, Nourish DC, about the grant. The grant is going to be released in late October. Uh, right now, it is October 14th. Um, I have not checked this this week, actually, so I'm not sure if it's up yet. Um, so just check for yourself and see if you qualify. Um, the first link that I'm sharing with you, it looks like I didn't share it with everybody, so I'm going to go again. Um, the first link I'm sharing with you is their updates, um, and then you can follow Capital Impact for more social media updates using this link right here. And with this, hopefully if you're in business um, and you've been making sales, you can qualify for this grant. I'm going to put in the requirements here in the chat as well. But um, to be eligible for the Nourish DC grant, you must have a food business. Uh, you must be physically located in the District of Columbia. Preferences for Ward 5, 7, and 8. You must be in business and generating revenue for more than six months, and you must have earned more than $10,000 of revenue in the past 12 months. So this is a really great opportunity for a lot of you. Um, please uh, let me know if you need help with the application if you do qualify, because um, Nourish DC has counselors that will help you apply. Uh, they offer technical assistance, and the DCSBDC also has counselors that can help. So if there's something that you might not be sure of, just make sure to tap into your resources, which is um, ultimately it's us. Uh, we're teams of consultants that are here to help you. So if you don't necessarily um, get what you're looking for with one, one counselor, just remember um, this is an advisory role. And not everybody gives the same advice. We, we give um, what we believe to be sound and, um, and proven advice, but they're, especially for marketing and branding, um, it's nice to get different people's outlooks and point of view uh, when they have um, that expertise. So if you need counseling, uh, don't forget to sign up for technical assistance. Um, this program is officially, today is the last day for this program. However, um, I am still available for technical assistance, especially because um, I don't only work with Dreaming Out Loud. I also work with the Small Business Development Center and with the Greater Washington Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. So if you need help, chances are... Um, one of those programs will be able to help you. But uh, the Dreaming Out Loud program is wonderful and they do provide this and that's why I'm here. So if you need help with anything for your business, just reach out to me. If you need help applying for this grant, reach out to me. 
Um, and I do, I do have a lag of about two weeks in, in being able to set an appointment um, just because I'm booked for two weeks um, out usually through this season. So just send me an email in advance so we can make the time to meet. And if you can't wait until we meet, um, just email me questions. Um, I might not get to them the exact day of, um, as much as I try to, though, I try to be really responsive, but I still see them and I and I do respond. Um, so the next thing I wanna talk about is open access DC. Um, and then this is one of those things that I've spoken to you about before. Um, open access DC is a new portal. It has just been launched. Um, and it was launched, well, I mean, it was launched last week, it feels like, I guess it was two weeks ago. Um, and it is hosted on our DCSBDC website. And then this is a portal that I helped put together a little bit. Um, I, all I did was look at it and give them my feedback. But if there's anything that you feel is missing or information that you need as a business owner and you think belongs on here, please let me know because this is still something that we're developing. So Open Access DC, you can find on our DCSBDC website. So you go to dcsbdc.org, which I'll put in the chat. Um, and then the DCSBDC is a free program. Um, all right, so we have the link there. And then you can go to Open Access DC, and then you can go into their website. So it talks a little bit about what uh, Open Access DC is. It is the Food and Society team at Aspen Institute put together this portal, and they intend to create this for every major city in the United States. And they started with Washington DC. So they started with us and they decided to host it on our DCSBDC website. And on this page, you can find um, a lot of information for food businesses. So you have resources, you have resources for how to develop your business plan. You have resources for um, how do you launch a business, um, different strategies for growth. And then you have for each industries within the industry, so restaurant, cafe, catering, food truck, private label, um, very specific information on how to open or maintain one of these and how to stay compliant. So it's a really excellent resource. It's new, 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 new. It just started like two weeks ago. And I have been really excited to share this with all of you. Um, it's finally launched. And the reason I'm so excited to share this with all of you is because before this, there wasn't really a list that told anybody what they needed as far as um, as far as how to open a food business. And this one, the nice thing is that they put it in different categories. It's really pretty simple to understand. And hopefully we can make this um, much more informative, especially for businesses who have been operating and who have been open, who might need updates on legal things, who might need more, more so I feel like if you've already had a business for a while in DC, um, you mostly just need to stay in the know of what it takes to be in compliance because DC changes things a lot. Um, so it's good to be in the know of what's going on in, in, in the city and then also what resources are there for you as a business owner. So this is already up. It's posted on the DCSBDC website. I, set, I put the link there for you so you could follow it. And just remember that the DCSBDC is a free, um, it's a free program uh, for its participants. So you can tap into a lot of the workshops and resources there as well. Um, so the next thing I'm gonna kind of go into is I'm gonna continue with my slides. Um, today, we are talking about working with investors. And this is a very interesting one because I've seen and lived a lot of scenarios with different types of investors. And, um, there's a few things that I want to talk about that I think are very important as far as this subject. 
So the first thing that happens is that um, when people want to open a restaurant, typically they come to me with a question. Uh, that question is always, how can I get the money that I need to open my restaurant? Um, usually the people have a concept put together, they thought through their menu, they have a team, and then they're looking for the funding. And what I always ask for, the first thing I ask for is a business plan. Um, in order to be taken seriously by an investor, you really have to just be clear about what you're doing and where you're going. That's the most important thing. So one of the tools that allows you to explain how clear your vision is and how, how well you know what you're gonna do and why you need the funds um, and why you're applying it to the best or the why in the wisest way or to the best of your ability um, the business plan is what helps you explain that in a better way. Um, every business needs a business plan. And if you've already been in business and you're revamping your business or you're, um, it, it's just healthy to do a business plan regularly. But what I always recommend more regularly is the business's vision. Um, I think that a business vision and a personal vision allows the entrepreneur, uh, the business owner, to know what type of business they're building and how do they want to grow it? What, Where are they going with their business? Um, because really, once you hit a certain level, you'll be able to go many different ways. You have different options for growth, expansion. Um, it depends on what, what your concept is, um, but you can go into manufacturing or you can go into to education, or you can go into um, retail associated things or mail order stuff. So your growth strategy as a food business is, is your potential is pretty great um, to where you can do lots of different things. And what investors are really going to want to see is what's going to give this food business longevity? What's going to bring the money in regularly throughout its life. Um, you don't really typically, or investors don't typically want to ex or, um, invest in fads or things that are gonna go out of style uh, very soon or quickly, or they wanna invest in solid concepts that they believe is going to give them a return on their investment. So when I think about all of those things, uh, the first thing I, I say is, um, who should I ask? So the reason I wonder who I should ask is because anytime you go into, um, a, you work with an investor, you're going into a partnership. You as a business owner are most likely investing as well. Um, you're getting an investor because you need more capital than what you have. And because you know that having that amount of capital is going to be able to make it so that you can create this business in its most effective manner that will um, help you get to the point to where you're making revenue very quickly. Um, when you are thinking about that as a business owner, you need to be thinking, who is a like-minded individual? Who is someone who thinks the way I think? not necessarily the way I think, but maybe they complement it or they have a skill that um, might be one of my weaknesses or a skill that I, I value or they have values that I value. Um, because when you're going into that relationship, you're going into it with, with a person and you're going to have to make an agreement and you're going to have to both believe in that agreement and you're both going to have to, or you're all, not just both, because a lot of times you have multiple investors, but you're all going to have to talk about um, different things and you need to know where your role is in, in that scenario. So when you have these relationships, um, the best thing you can do to ask an investor for an investment is to 
show them that you're serious and that you're honest and that this is an actually great opportunity. And because you've taken the time to develop your business plan by that point, then you can really show that through your business plan. And if you need help showing that through your business plan, that's what you have technical assistance for. So just like I say in every single um, workshop that I do, uh, this is just an overview of a lot of different themes, but where you really, really get the most help is if you schedule technical assistance time and that we can talk one-on-one -on -one about your business plan, about how to pose the question to your investor and how to strategize that because it is very individual to every, every individual business owner's network. Um, it's very unique to, to each business. So when I decide on who I plan to ask, I, I decide on asking people who have like-minded values and who want to go the same place I want to go to with the concept um, and that we can complement each other in some way. Um, a lot of the time people like to partner up with me because they know that I'm a pretty dedicated, committed person as far as whatever I choose to work with. Um, and when I work with somebody, I definitely want someone who is invested, who, who believes in the concept, who wants to maintain a really high standard because my standards are really high. And I make sure that if we both or at least if we all have the same type of work ethic, nobody's going to feel left behind. Um, and I have had different forms of partnerships. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well, as far as the negotiation phase and what does that look like. Um, but when I look at who I plan to ask, I think about the network that, I, that I've tapped into, what relationships have I built and who would also benefit or enjoy working with this type of concept? Um, and what connections do they have that would benefit me? Um, I do uh, really love the show Shark Tank. Um, I've always watched it. I, I think it's awesome. I own a bunch of Shark Tank stuff <laughs> I've seen on the show. And when I think about uh, what you look for in a partner, I think about a little bit about that show because people are usually looking for an investor that they can tap into their network. And that's actually an incredibly important part of developing these relationships. So first I make a list of who do I plan to ask. Then I uh, look and see um, if my product or my service appeals to a mass market because an investor is gonna wanna get paid back and they're gonna want to make a profit. So when you're speaking to someone, you need to know what they want to hear from you, not in a fake way because you're not making anything up. You're not inventing any information. Everything that you're doing is because you did research and you got training and you know how you're gonna execute it. So you do have to have that confidence. Even though you're you're presenting something that doesn't exist yet or something that's just starting, doesn't mean you're making things up. It just means you're forecasting, which is a very different thing. Um, making things up is, you know, when people just kind of guesswork numbers, but when you're forecasting, you're doing the research and you're taking your due diligence to look at what all of those expenses that you might have are going to be. And that's why you're in this workshop, because in this workshop, we spoke about all of those different expenses that um, you might not have thought of before that you will now include in your business plan. Um, but when you're selling to an investor, their, their ears are going to like wake up or they're going to really pay attention when you say, this product appeals to this market, or this is the demographic in this area, this is my target market. And you've done an actual study to see if your product is something that is, a, it has a market. Does it have a market? Is there a need for it in the market? And we have to be really honest with ourselves in this. 
because as entrepreneurs, we do tend to invent things that we believe would be so great for everybody. And there is always a certain market for what your product is. Not everybody is going to love it. Um, or they might all love it. They're just not all going to pay for it, buy it. You need to know who is your consumer. So for food businesses, we're talking about um, approaching investors. When you're writing your business plan, what do you have that you offer that appeals to a lot of people? And sometimes it's like, uh, for example, Jack's Garden Salsa in Michigan. I, I always thought that story was really cool because it was a Mexican restaurant that did Mexican restaurant so-so. It was it was like a Midwestern re Mexican restaurant. So it was not incredibly authentic Mexican, but they made salsa that everybody loved and they started buying it by the jugs. And once they got it in stores, then Campbell's noticed them. And then Campbell's wanted to buy them because that was um, a successful concept in its simplicity. If you have something that people can relate to, you just need to see what it is, how many people it relates to. So just in looking at the businesses here um, in the room right now, um, if you have, for example, chocolate, um, there are a lot of people who chocolate appeals to. And there's so many different examples that you can put in your business plan to show uh, why. Uh, or why are healthy snacks something that is important in um, today's market? Why am I going to sell out every time I produce a batch? What's my um, what's the reasoning behind that? But also, what's the data? And if you need a market report for your area of where you plan to sell, uh, the DCSBDC does a market report. It takes about a month, but we get real information from the SBA. And it's very updated, good demographic information that helps a lot when you're selecting either a market or a location or a new stand, putting it somewhere. But you have to see how you're going to appeal to a mass market. So in order to do that, you have to find out if there's the market and where you're going to be. Um, does your product or service provide a social impact? Um, that's a very important one because especially I feel that this is something that's been popping up even more in the last couple of decades. Um, but just in general, when the business is doing a good social act, a positive thing for the world, um, people are going to want to support it, uh, especially the investor. It feels good to an investor to feel like they put money somewhere that benefits more people than just the business. And I like that a lot. It's something that I, I look for actually, because I feel like a business can be so much more impactful than any one individual, that to have that as a guiding principle to give back in some way is usually a very beautiful thing. And when there's one partner that wants to give and there's another partner that does not, it creates a big conflict uh, because that's a more uh, that's an issue that that hits very deep in your soul when you do want to give or when you don't. It's not a very superficial necessity. It's something that it's a core value. So think about: Does your product or service provide a social impact? What, what partners could you strategize that believe in that um, social impact? Or if not, then that's fine. But if you get an investor that does want you to do the social impact thing, then you have to figure out um, that whole can of worms, which is just a negotiation between how that's going to work out. Um, so that's a very important question. And I, I read it in a very good book that I'm going to recommend to you. But I, I do like that question, and it's a question that investors ask about a good amount. The other one is, um, does your business have a significant repeat um, customer base? Does your business have significant repeat customers? 
that you can invoice. And that's super important as well, just for the stability of the concept, uh, to have some sort of repeat um, and just cycling income. Um, you really, really need to have different forms of income. And then when a business has subscription-based things or um, things where they know already how much they might sell or at least have a minimum per month, that's super important because it allows the business to manage their inventory better. It allows for the business to be healthier because you they already know what the sales are going to be. So you strategize accordingly um, and you're able to grow because once you have a good customer base, um, it, it just kind of snowballs from there as long as you maintain the relationships the right way. So if your business has significant repeat customers that you invoice repeatedly, I mean, there's no investor that's not going to love that. It, it's a very difficult thing to achieve, but you can definitely achieve it with the food business because a food is an affordable luxury. You can have something that is a little bit higher price point than your competitors, but it's still affordable. It's still you know, 20 bucks, 30 bucks, something that somebody might commit to making that purchase every month, um, or they might commit to making that purchase twice a month. Um, I bet you have an experience like that in your food world. My experience, and this is going to sound a little bit superficial, but it's in makeup, actually. Um, I really enjoy makeup, and I, um, have an Ipsy subscription that I pay $12 a month for. And I don't buy makeup at all. I don't go out and shop for it at the stores, but I get these little sampler packets that I love because then I can try a new eyeshadow tone or I can try a new eyeliner that I wanted to try or a, a new lipstick that I wouldn't have gone out and purchased for myself. And that subscription is silly, but I enjoy it. And I'm always going to have it probably until I don't want it anymore, but I'm not, I'm not intending to cancel it because it's 12 bucks. So what could you do in your food business that has a similar situation to where it's an affordable monthly fee, but they're getting something out of it. They're getting something great out of it. If you have I, I'm always going to talk about the snack company because um, Veronica has um, been here at every webinar along uh, this series. Um, so I, I'm talking a lot about that. But if you have a specific industry you want to talk about, then I will too. But if you have a, a snack, um, you could do like a healthy snack of the month club. And Maybe in the beginning, you might have 20 clients or you might have 30 steady customers. But as the business grows and as your time moves forward, your customer base will grow and you could have potentially repeat monthly customers. And when you do that, you can also upsell. You could say, add, um, I don't know, something, uh, add a uh, a recipe card for uh, $2 or I don't know, but you would add something to, to it. So you would give the option. So anytime someone receives their monthly order, you would also give them an option to purchase something else in some way or get something at a discount. And that's really how those um, subscription services, um, they uh, multiply and they get bigger and they, they amount to something. So in the beginning, it's a little hard because you're doing a few small orders, but the more you grow it, it's amazing. So because I really encourage this, I also say schedule technical assistance time if you need help um, understanding or strategizing how you're gonna do it if you want to. But if, a, um, if an investor sees that, if an investor sees that you as the business owner have thought far enough ahead to think that you need to solidify your monthly sales, then they're probably going to really like you because they're going to see that you're being um, 
strategic, really. It really is just about being strategic. And um, I, I always like to kind of go back to lessons I've learned in my life and in the past. But when I was getting trained to be a chef um, and I was getting trained in business, I think maybe once or twice uh, someone taught me about uh, pre-sales or selling first before you produce. And I did take it seriously, but it wasn't until I had my own place that I realized that that was an, um, a necessity. It's, it's, it was for me a necessity because I wanted to make sure that all overhead was covered every month and that all the other sales were extra. And I, um, you know, they're not extra, extra in the sense that the more you increase sales also, the more you increase your own costs, but they're not something that's, that is going to make or break me as far as paying my rent, um, as a, as a restaurant. So any activities that you can do to pre-sell, to create a membership, to create a, a real solid community with your business, the better. Um, and I, and if you need help figuring out how to do that, we can develop a vision for that. But investors definitely want to see uh, something. They want to make sure that you're going to make the money that you say you're going to make. They're, they're reading your business plan to make sure that it's real information or that you know what you're talking about. Uh, because if you don't know what you're talking about, they're not going to invest because those are that's a big risk um, and they're taking on that risk by investing um the other question is that you want to ask yourself is is your business scalable um the reason i spoke so much about secret formulas and secret recipes in the hiring and training webinar and in the manufacturing webinar is because I want you as the business owner to believe and try to practice working on your business rather than in your business. And that is hard to do a lot of times. And I totally get it because I am, um, I myself work a lot. You know, I'm, I'm pretty much a workaholic, but it's also because I extremely enjoy working. Um, I don't know like what to do when I'm not doing something having to do with food. Um, so I enjoy it. But for your businesses, if you really enjoy cooking because you're opening a, a food business and you enjoy cooking and creating the food, open yourself up to allow yourself to delegate. And the reason that you, you always want to do this is because you're going to get burnt out. Um, as a business owner, you have more important responsibilities. You have the responsibility of, of, of growing your business, of increasing your sales. And at that point, it's not just because of you. It's for your employees and it's for the people who are growing along with you. Um, you can not want to grow. I mean, some people want to stay the same size their, the whole life of their business. But really, when I say this a lot too, when you're opening a small business, the intention is not that it stays small forever, it's that you grow it. And you can still keep the essence of the small business, but still grow financially. And you need to provide that financial stability for yourself and for your employees because, um, because why not? That's just a better life if, if you have enough to pay for everything and to sustain a beautiful concept. And if you find yourself burnt out years later, a lot of restaurants quit that way. That's why a lot of restaurants that have been open for a long time close. A lot of the time it's because the business owner is um, burnt out because they've been there every day along the way uh, because they didn't delegate things. And the reason they didn't delegate things is mostly because of payroll problems a lot of the time. and um that's that's improper business planning a lot of the time like you when you develop your business plan you need to make sure that you pay yourself and every role in the business so that you can know 
that you're going to make that paycheck that's going to allow you to have a healthy lifestyle as a business owner as well. So is your business scalable is really important because if I'm an investor and I'm looking at your business plan and you're um, telling me about this amazing concept, I wonder, is this something that this person's going to be able to delegate and train a team and replicate without them physically having to do it? Um, and that answer varies depending on who you are or what type of um, business you are. For example, food businesses are very scalable. Just look at McDonald's and all the other concepts out there. Um, scaling is pretty uh, rhythmic in the food industry because there is a system. There's an actual system as to how you put these types of businesses together, uh, which we spoke about already in the hiring and training class. Um, but there are standard operating procedures and systems to be able to scale your food business. Now, if it's a service, if it's something that requires um, a special, very special skill or a personality skill, it's going to be more challenging to scale. So understanding that is very important. And when your investor asks you, um, how are you planning to scale this business? you are ready with an answer or at least with an idea. A lot of the time they will also have another idea and there'll be a dialogue. Um, and those dialogues are always incredibly enlightening actually and, and great and helpful. Uh, but you will be asked this question because um, it's very difficult to invest in a business that depends on somebody because we're human and humans are we go down and up and all over the place all the time. So we we are not always the same and steady. Sometimes things happen in our lives that we have to drop everything and go and do it. Well, what if you can't because you have to be at the business every day? So investors are wondering those things too, just for your own well-being to see if it's a business worth or not worth investing in, but is it wise to invest in it? Um, then the next thing that you were, you wonder about after you ask yourself all those questions about which we asked, which is how do I find enough funding? These are the questions that you ask invest or that you ask yourself before you approach investors. Um, the next thing that you talk about is presenting it. So once you've asked yourself all those questions that I just, we just spoke about. Um, how do I approach them? So what I like to do, if I'm going to approach investors, I typically look at who I know that has expressed an interest in investing. If you have not heard someone express an interest in investing in, in a concept that you, um, that you worked or that, that you could work in or something like that, that's okay. Um, that you need to just think about who's your who's actually going to want to invest, you know, because you don't want to waste your time either. You don't want to go approaching all everybody because people will take your meeting um, and they'll be nice to you, but it is an ends up being a waste of time. And you want to be very intentional with who you select. So the first thing I do is write a list of people who I would like to work with and people who might have the possibility of investing if there's an investment needed, um, or what type of investment is it? So first you identify that list of people, then you figure out how will I approach this person? And everybody's different. So you as a person um, hopefully can have that intuitive nature or empathy or just understanding of, a, of a, the person's character to know how they might want to be approached. Some people love details. I love details, all the details. I want to know everything, all the things. I want to know what brand you've developed. I want to know the logo. I want to know where you're buying things from. I want to know um, how you're going to sell it. I want to know what your marketing ideas are. I want to know all the stuff. 
So I love business plans, but some people don't want to know all that stuff. They really will focus on the gist of the concept and then the financials. And with those types of people, you would definitely approach them differently. So you need to think about the personality of who, who you're approaching and, and then that's going to determine your how. That's going to allow you to say, okay, I will approach this person with a pitch deck or I will approach this person with a full business plan or I will not even take my business plan to this person. I will email it to them and I will call them on the phone a few times because I know they're busy and then they'll call me back. Um, but the ultimate uh, point in saying this is you need to know who you're reaching out to and think about what's the best way to approach them. Um, raising investment money is not a, 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 uh, a quick thing. It's not fast. People don't just, most people, some people do this, but most people don't aren't going to take $5,000, $50,000, $100,000, a million dollars, and just write you a check. Um, they mostly, you have to let them know well in advance, but that's healthy. Um, I've only ever approached people last minute in situations that I knew it would benefit them in some way, but really you need to give the person time to think about their investment so that they have the confidence that they're going to need in order to be a reliable partner in this journey of starting this food business. So because what you're looking for is someone to join you on your journey, giving them time is really important. And I, I really want to point that out because I've seen more people approach investors the month or two before they want to, um, they need the capital, then if they had just, if they had just done it when they originally thought of the concept and developed a business plan and told them what the plan was and done all that stuff before, well, you know, they would have all of that ground covered and developing that understanding and relationship about the business to where the person already has, the investor already has the proper understanding of what it's gonna take, what's the, the time requirement or what's the what are the requirements from the investor and what are your expectations from them? So that doesn't happen very quickly. So I do wanna say that when you're approaching an investor, try not to do it in a hurry uh, because it will turn them off. Um, because I mean, that's just nature. It's how we make our investment decisions. Um, so the next thing you think about is, okay, now I know how I'm gonna approach them. What's how, what format is it gonna be best in? And I love um, business plans that look like kind of like magazines uh, because I like pictures, I like visuals, especially for food concepts because food concepts are very visual. You need, um, to, to, to develop an atmosphere or a different place of escape for your customers. So I will look at business plans that have the color scheme, um, the pictures of what decor might look like because I'm typically looking at food type businesses. But um, depending on who you're approaching, you will decide what format will work best for you. This is somewhere where we will help uh, at the DCSBDC. Charles Mott is wonderful for that. Dreaming out loud, I'm a counselor here so I can help you. And then I would be happy to connect you with other counselors uh, that give free business counseling because they give such good advice, especially on, on these points on how to present your business plan. Because typically we're working with the SBA and you're looking for um, a low interest grant for your business, but the standard of the information that they're looking for is very high. So that's where we help prepare you. But your format is very important. I love, like I said, the magazine format um, for food businesses because I can see pictures. And if you're wondering what that looks like, um, I put it together with you. Um, so, 
it's just gonna it would look like a like a portfolio like a magazine um but i love doing business plans that way um, another way that you could do make the information easy to read is to just give them a pitch deck um, and your pitch deck should also be summarized and it should only take you um, maybe I, I like I mean when I do a pitch sometimes people say five minutes um, you're in the room with the person so typically your meetings are going to be 30 minutes. So you want to keep your pitch to like 10 minutes, but that's all depending on, on what scenario you're in, but make sure that your information is easy to read. That's the main point. Um, the ink or the font color, the paper color, everything has to, to be legible. Um, is your plan easy to understand? So if I read your business plan, will I close it up and then leave it knowing what size team you need, what is your, what's your menu or what are you offering? Where are you producing it? Who are you selling to? How are you reaching out to your customers? What's your logo look like? What are you offering? So you want to make sure that your plan as they read it is easy to understand as far as the plan itself. This is something that's doable, um, is what they have to think to themselves. So they have to read it and say, okay, this system makes sense. What they said, the way they're going to do it makes sense. Um, but clarity, is your plan easy to understand? Is your, is your plan, it's a concept, it's a content of your plan, something that when I read it, I believe that it's factual and it's doable. Um, that's very important. I'll give an example because it's a little bit of a complex thought, but for example, if I see that in a business plan that somebody has a um, home occupancy permit and they're producing their food from home, but their business plan says that they're going to sell 10,000 boxes of um, a snack, so Oreos or something, of cookies a day. If I see in your plan that you are operating out of your home or out of a shared kitchen like Tastemakers and you plan to sell 10,000 boxes of cookies a day, I'm not going to believe you because there's no way. There's just simply no way. If you're in a shared kitchen, you're sharing ovens. So you only have like two ovens at a time. That's not going to make 10,000 boxes of cookies. And at home, it doesn't matter how many ovens you have, you're not going to be making 10,000 boxes of cookies from home. So your business plan um, is not going to work. So you need to make sure that your business plan makes sense and that it's clear and easy to understand in the way you write your, your plan to make it clear, the content clear. Um, on top of just the concept that you're writing about, you also want to think about the font. So um, the clarity is your plan easy to understand kind of can, can be, have two meanings. One, is it clear to understand when I pick it up? And is it clear to understand when I read it that I know what your plan is? Um, a lot of people, this is why a lot of people decide to put a non-disclosure agreement in with their business plan. Because the business plan is so complete that they really need somebody to not disclose it so that it's not repeated. Um, so... Sometimes people want to include non-disclosure agreements before they share their business plans. Um, you can definitely get help with this. If you need help with how to get an NDA, uh, we work with the DC Bar Pro Bono Program um, at the DCSBDC. So just reach out to me and then I will send you to Adia Coleman is the counselor for that. And um, they can team you up with the Pro Bono uh, Program. Um, Will I share with you the magazine? 
I will definitely share with you it in private, Veronica. Um, I am going to make for my future webinars, I'm going to make a mock, like a fake one. Um, let me see if I can find an example just on Google, but I can share it also one-on-one. -on -one. This is one of the big reasons a lot of the time I also um, tell people to um, download LivePlan because Live, or not LivePlan, Canva, to work on Canva because it makes it easy um, to format stuff and it looks beautiful. Uh, so let me see if I can find a example real quick for you, um, Veronica, because um, it would be amazing if, for especially for your business, if you had really cool graphics um, incorporated in your business plan. I'm going to just go into my own life plan account and show you some mock business plans. Um, but with the mock business plans, they don't look the way I want them to look. The only good business plans that I have um, are the ones I've made for, for myself. Um, and um, I can't show them on this video because this is going to be posted on YouTube and that's all private information. So I don't want to show you this on this webinar, but I can definitely do it over technical assistance. Um, but I will share with you oh, what I'm doing right now, which is going into the live plan. Um, the live plan has sample business plans. Uh, when you're writing your business plan, this is a good a good uh, website to go on. I love Life Plan, and in their sample library, you can go in and you can look for the type of business that you want to open. Which in this case, we're going to go with um, retail and online store. Let's try that. So we're going to click on this, and you have tons of samples of different business plans for different reasons. So these are all just templates. These are um, good guidance. They're just a stepping stone. And then in order to create your business plan to be more uh, visually pleasing, that's what I recommend signing up for technical assistance. Uh, we can definitely help you with that. Um, I'll, I'll kind of coach you step by step. And unfortunately, no, I can't share the other business plans because they're private info. Um, but I was trying to see if I could find one that I wanted to share. But these look like, um, let's do bicycle art, even though I want food, but we'll just click this one. So in this um, business plan example, and I shared this in another webinar I think you watched before, you can go through each uh, section of a business plan, of that type of business plan, and see what they wrote and see what their, their business plan looks like. So this is mostly just the content. And this is for a general business plan. But for restaurants, I always include a lot of pictures. And I make sure that it looks that the um, that the, the business plan is really a portfolio of what the, the restaurant concept is going to be, what the, what the vibe is gonna be at the restaurant. And then as far as a product, you can definitely do that because you can um, have what the packaging is gonna look like. You can put the colors of the different uh, ingredients as your, um, your colors of your document. There's a lot of ways that you can incorporate your concept into the document. So for food um, business plans, I really recommend it because it gives people a, a bit deeper connection to what they're reading. Um, and ultimately you have to make them hungry. You have to make it so that they want to taste whatever that is that you're selling. And the fact that they can invest in it is even better because then that's when they start thinking, I'm going to make money with this because I want to eat that. And if I want to eat it that badly, everybody else does. And that's really the logic behind a lot of investors. So 
um, your document has to look like that. But I will be happy to, I will follow up with you via email. Um, I have to follow up you, with you via email anyway. And um, we can do that and I'll share with you different examples. Um, but I, I like that part of the business plan. I like the idea of reflecting what it is that we want to reflect because when, when the business actually happens, I have a tool, I have a document that I can use as an example for color schemes, as an example for how I want a room to be decorated, or even dishes, like how I'm gonna plate the dishes, because we already crossed that path, because we already thought about it before. So when I need it, I have it and I've done it. Not when, when you're living it, when you're in the moment, and it's the first time that you're crossing these big, very important decisions, you're not gonna do it as well as if you would have written a business plan and given it the proper amount of thought process that it needed in order to be the best. So I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm just saying it could, it could be the best if you just take the time to, to, to do the development. So um, for this business plan, this is kind of the, I, I don't wanna call it boring, but it is just the numbers and the, um, and the facts and the different important sections, which are the executive summary, the company summary, the market analysis, the strategy and implementation, management summary and financial plan. And your business plan will require all of that information. And this is why also I always recommend Open Access DC. Open Access DC, you can go here to write a business plan. And they have sample business plan templates also. So even though I went to um, Live Plan, Live Plan is paid, it's $33 a month. Here, you can go and look in and Open Access DC has business plan templates for all kinds of different types of businesses. So if what we want is a food and beverage plan, then you can see here all of these different types of food and beverage plan. Let me see if I find, um, we have coffee house, hydroponics, um, all right, well, I'm gonna pick a dessert bakery, let's do that one. So you can see all of the different sections that they list for this. And then I guess if you take the time to go on Open Access DC because it's launched now, you can go in and look at this as well. Um, I really like Life Plan. Uh, so it's just whatever program works best for you, but you can see all kinds of different examples. Um, and also if you need help with formatting, um, Stacy Palmer or um, Janine Biggins, they both work with marketing and branding. And I can always help with formatting, but I need to know what your branding looks like. I can't format it without knowing what your branding looks like. So um, that is a whole, it's a whole exploration right there. And I think that when you are approaching an investor and you have the plan and you formatted it the way the restaurant's gonna be and you've shown that you've done all of this work and thought, they're just gonna see a more complete business. And that's ultimately what they want to invest in. They want to invest in a business that's going to work and that it's complete, not a business that's going to suffer because things were left behind or not thought of or not done well, um, especially in today's market because um, our customers are only getting um, their standards raised. So because we're dealing with a customer base that is has very high standards, and I wouldn't say dealing with them actually, because I, I love having customers with high standards because I have high standards and um, 
it's fun to talk about food with my customers that know about food. And it's fun to talk about techniques with my customers who know about techniques. And so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of things that for your business plan could be thought of uh, before, before you give it to an investor. Um, it'll just help you along the way. But a lot of it, like I said before, is in the formatting. You can really communicate that. Um, and yeah, in DC, we have very high standards for food, um, just like I was mentioning before. And making sure that you have a well thought up business just is going to mean that your standard of, of everything is going to be higher, or at least it's understood that way. Um, so once you think about the clarity of the business plan, how you're going to execute it, um, have some samples. Um, that would be great. So if you have a product, you give it to the investor and the investor, you know, tries a product and then they try some, or they try some samples and then they read the business plan and then they get hungry. They're like, wow, this is awesome. I want to see this product in stores. Um, and it sounds really simple. And, and I know that that sounds like a lot of you might be thinking, of course, Carolina, obviously I would take a sample, but I've seen a lot of people approach people about their food business without having a prototype, without having a, um, a sample or anything to show for the product itself. Uh, so a lot of people have food ideas. So they're like, I'm going to make this, or I'm going to make this type of snack or this type of frozen food. But they haven't actually formulated it. So samples are extremely important because when, when somebody tries whatever, they try the snack, they try the drink, they try the, um, the dish, it shows the investor that you've taken the time to formulate your offerings, that you've taken the time to really think through what you're going to offer. And to me, a lot of the time I'm thinking that that person has already started to gain an understanding of what exactly we're going to offer and what that's going to demand. Um, when someone shows a product, you you can kind of assume, okay, they created this. So therefore, they know how they're going to execute it. They know how they're going to produce it. They know how they're going to keep it at the highest quality. Um, they know how this, the shelf life is. Um, so that's all stuff that I'm thinking about as um, I'm thinking about a food business and I'm reading their, their business plan. But giving me a sample gives me that um, understanding. And I'm still going to ask questions as an investor, but I also am glad to try a sample because that means that they took the time to develop something to have me try it and had that confidence that that will, you know, the same confidence that they, that business owner is going to have to having anyone try it. Um, and that's very important. So samples and then testimonials. Do you have positive reviews from a reputable person or an organization? And that's something you always want to include in, um, in any sort of resume. And at the end of the day, business plans are kind of like a resume. Um, it, well, your resume is included in it, right? Um, but the testimonials reflect a few things. The first thing it reflects is that you've taken the time to develop a relationship with someone, a client or a, you know, a doctor or a, some sort of professional in the industry. And what that means to me is that you have the confidence to um, represent your product, that you have the confidence and the ability to get out there and be the face of your business. Um, when you have a testimonial, I know that you've already approached somebody. I know that you've already asked for their testimonial and they gave you good feedback. So it takes a certain type of personality to go out and seek testimonials. And that is very important 
because as a business owner, I mean, that's a lot of a big part of the job is going out, making people aware of your product, making people aware that it, you know, the business exists, gathering their testimonials so the next person can see your reference or can see that um, your product is great. And that's a huge part of being the, the business owner or the face of the business. So having a testimonial in your business plan allows me to know that you have that ability and that understanding of how important it is. Um, when you incorporate your testimonials, you can incorporate them from all kinds of different places on your business plan. You can have testimonials from Instagram. You can have letters. You can, not, in, not long letters, but if you have a little blurb from somebody, that's great to include. Um, and if there's someone that's a, that's a professional and this is a health benefit type business, then having like a doctor, someone promote it too. Um, it just shows that people stand behind your product as well. So there's a lot um, to all of these points and they sound simple, but they're, they're very, they have a lot of different aspects to them. So samples, a sample is not just a sample. It's a lot more than that. A testimonial, it's not just a testimonial. It's a lot more than that. So because these, these things are so important, you have to put them in your business plan. Um, and it's not okay not to have them in your business plan. Um, and in order to do that, and if you need help doing that, and if you're not and you, if you haven't gathered testimonials before, or you haven't gone out and asked for them, it's okay. That's why we do technical assistance. So I'm here um, to do that. And like I said before, November, December, and January, I'm really going to be doing a lot of technical assistance. September was very busy with webinars, so that's why I was so booked. But now moving forward, it's technical assistance time here in DC. So if you need help training with things and how to approach people, um, let me know and then we can work on that because that's very important. Um, that's extremely important for whenever you're getting testimonials, but also as you're talking to the business owner. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that too in a second. Um, the next point that I wanted to talk about was preparing your pitch. So um, when you're preparing your pitch, you really need to think about who are you pitching to? Who is the person that you're talking to for your pitch? How does your product relate to that person? And can you personify or can you personalize or do something unique or something to tie them to your concept or your product in your pitch. Maybe um, if you've asked the investor to meet with you and they've agreed, you know something about them. So when you meet with them, make sure that number one, you know what you're gonna go in there and talk about. You know your numbers because that's the most important part. You know that your business makes money and, and how. Uh, you know how you're gonna execute it. You know what team you're gonna need. And the pitch is important, but it's just a presentation. The, it's a tool. And that's the most important thing, way to look at it is that the pitch deck is a tool, but the pitch itself is how you interact with the investor. And that is very dependent on you knowing your stuff. So you know all you know the things about your business, you know how you wanna grow it, you have a clear vision, you have a business plan, you have a financial forecast, and then you have these items, which is your company mission. Um, you need to know what your mission is as a company, even if it evolves along the way. Um, so you want to put that in there because that allows the person to see, okay, this is why this company has opened. <laughs> this is why they exist. Um, the product, obviously, you know, on a, you have to mention how you're going to make money. What is your product? Uh, what about it is special? Uh, where can I buy it? Um, what need are you filling in the market? 
So did you see a gap in the market? And what was your opportunity? What was your opportunity? And how did you fix it? And who did you sell it to? Is there enough of a market in your area where you want to sell your product to, to even meet that expectation of sales that you have? We have to make sure that there's a market. And if there's not a market, how are you going to reach the market? Or what are you going to do to cover your, your sales? Are you going to do a subscription base thing? Are you going to ship online? Like, how are you going to reach people? Because they have to buy from you in order for this to be successful. Who's your competition? Um, you don't want to go way into your competition, but you definitely want to acknowledge that you have other people who do similar things, but yours is better because something. Um, and you will always have competition. Um, the, the, the world has been around for far too long that there, are, there aren't that, that many really, really original ideas. Everything's an adaptation of something these days. So you can always relate something to something else. So there will be competition uh, for anything. And if you need to identify or you need help identifying where that competition is, then schedule technical assistance time and we'll look at it um, and together. And hey, you might even surprise me and come up with a completely original idea with no competition, but it that's, that's like very rare. Um, and then you want to talk about your solution, which is how you're gonna fill the need in the market um, and how much that's gonna cost you and how much you need for your investment. So you're going to want a financial forecast so that you can show the investor that you need that much money because you're gonna do this with it. You need that much money because it's gonna be, if you don't have that much money, it's really gonna limit the ability to make your plan work. Um, so you have to have a forecast for that. And if you need help with that, again, we do that technical assistance. So just schedule your technical assistance time. And then the next part is the negotiation. So after you raise the money in a way, you know, you've gotten commitment from the investor, the um, person wants to invest in your business. Um, then you have to actually talk about it and come up with um, some sort of agreement. Uh, this is the most interesting part, in my opinion, as far as seeking an investor. Um, but the negotiation, I think in any negotiation, you need to be clear, just like I was talking about before with your business plan. So you're coming at them with um, an ask. You're asking for a certain investment amount, and you're telling them what it's going to cost you to do it and what your financial forecast is gonna look like. So then you guys talk about what, what are your contributions? What are your responsibilities? If the person is investing this, what do you expect of them? What do they expect of you? Um, so you have to have these conversations and they have to be written in an operating agreement. Um, it has to be written because you have to write everything in a partnership, but you never know. So if you need help with that, the DCSBDC does work with the DC Bar Pro Bono Program at American University, and we can connect you with help. But typically, you're going to want to talk to your attorney for it. Um, the way I like to work with attorneys is I will do my best to to write something up and put something together so that when I go to meet with my attorney, I'm very clear as to what I would like or what I think is best. And then I take advice. Um, that's really how I work with everything because it's a lot more effective. But when you're working with attorneys, just like I said before, be prepared to, to already know what you need and kind of do the due diligence before you go in and meet with them because otherwise it's going to be very expensive. Um, but if you already know what you're, what you're agreeing to and you already know what your operating agreement is going to look like, 
then having an attorney look it over, make sure that it looks all all legal and solid, and then they put in their things that they always do with formatting and whatnot, that's way better for you um, just as a partner. And it's good for both sides. Both sides want to know that everything they've agreed on is true and that it happens because that's important, especially in a business like a food business that's very um, you know, stressful sometimes. And how will you make decisions as a company needs to be there as well. Um, how will you divide voting, um, all those procedures, right? Um, and make sure to have separate representation. So you can't use the same attorney for both of you. Um, make sure that you each all have your own. And that's just for health reasons. It's just better for you. Um, it's just, just better. It's just a good practice to have. And a big reason is just because they're two different parties. It can be pretty neutral and um, it puts, and I, I think legally it's required, but I've seen a lot of people not do it. So that's why I'm saying have the separate legal representation um, and have an action plan or a timeline. And this avoids a lot of frustration between you and your investors or you and your partners um, because you will know your timeline. So you all agree on your timeline beforehand so you can keep each other accountable about things. Um, it's very, when you're dealing with a lot of partners or you have a lot of people in, in one situation, um, it's very easy for somebody to get frustrated because it's not happening fast enough or for somebody to be really overwhelmed because it's happening too fast for them. Um, there are all kinds of scenarios because time is relative. And because the experience of it is relative, I mean, somebody can be super overwhelmingly busy in their job and the other person might just have these savings that they're putting into the business and they're out on vacation. And so they, they're calling a lot because they really wanna know what's going on while the other person's super busy. So there are a lot of situations and I've seen, I only talk about them because I've seen them happen so much that I just wanna stress the fact that when you're putting in the negotiation, write a timeline of the execution of the project. Um, that is going to help all the sides. It's gonna help the investor and it's gonna help the person executing it to not get angry because sometimes when you're operating it, it when you're operating it, things sometimes take longer than what you expected in permitting and as a business owner in general. You might have a projected date and you might be way off from that date. But if you have a timeline where you can be realistic with the person from the jump, hey, this takes about six months to do, or this takes about two months to do, it protects you as a person who's executing the project and it protects or it builds an expectation for the investor just to understand you already gave them what, how much time it takes, you know, and there's things that you have no control over in a lot of these situations. So it just takes that much time. Um, so there are different scenarios that play out like this. Um, I know I'm being pretty vague, but it's real. It, I know that um, you can kind of see where I'm going with it as far as developing an action plan or a timeline within your negotiation. Because if you've agreed to that throughout your negotiation, then you'll both have really great expectations and it maintains the relationship positive. Um, and those are the main things. As far as how the investor gives you the funds, that varies as well. And I recommend talking to your CPA um, about it, a certified public accountant, and to also an, your attorney, if, if you have a good business attorney, but typically your CPA would be able to give you your best option for how to invest or your best option for how to take the investment. So that's something that um, changes uh, over time, I feel like. I don't know. I've seen it happen um, just a few times. So 
I, I don't know how much that changes, but like I say, anytime I'm giving financial advice, I say, talk to your CPA, see if that's the best strategy for you financially of how to receive the money from the investment and vice versa, how, how um, they might want to, to move it as well. Um, because that's going to affect a lot of things. It's going to affect taxes um, and it's going to sometimes affect accounting stuff. So those are the main um, points in the investment side as far as approaching investors. Um, at the end of the day, just remember that your investors are putting their bet on you. They're betting on you. Uh, you're approaching them with a plan. And so when you approach them, make sure that you know what you're looking for from them. And if you're not looking for input from them, be clear about that too, because some people don't want to give input. And so um, if some people don't want to give input, then maybe you have just a silent investor. Uh, so you have to figure out how, how you want to structure it and what you want to do. Um, but that's how you approach investors. <laughs> that's a funny class, but um, that was the end of this series. And the reason it's the end of this Dreaming Out Loud series is because that's what you do once you write a business plan. But throughout this series, we had seven, seven classes. And throughout the series, what we did was give you all the different points that you need to think about when you're writing your business plan and as you go into the food business, or even if you're in the food business and you're looking to, to strategize something differently, or you might be dealing with some sort of issue, either in staffing and team building in hiring in, in sales in social media. So just ask for technical assistance. Um, if any of this stuff rang a bell, and if you feel like you need more information, uh, schedule your technical assistance. You can reach me um, at chef underscore Carolina Gomez is my Instagram. Uh, Food Biz Mentor is my business Instagram. And um, some of you have messaged me there as well. And I do check it every day. Um, and then DOLDC, because Dreaming Out Loud is, um, it, it needs everyone's support. It's a really wonderful program. I've seen amazing businesses grow out of this incubator. Um, I, I think the, the first class I started with had 11 students and that was about five years ago. And it those businesses have um, really, really grown. So thank you for, for, for everything, Dreaming Out Loud, for being able to offer these resources to small business owners, uh, to Nourish DC, to Capital One, and to all of you for coming. Um, I'm going to stick around a little bit just in case you have any questions. I know today's was a big, uh, <laughs> I, I don't want to call it complicated, but it was a little bit complex. Um, and before you go, I will also share this via email to the participants, but I've already done this before. Um, the book that I use to come up with a lot of these different lessons are um, how to win friends and um, influence people. I like how to win friends and influence people. This is a very old book. It's by Dale Carnegie and it talks about making a sale. And um, it's a really great um, book about how to approach people. So approaching your investors, this is very relevant for that. And then the other one is Target Funding by uh, Kedma O. Oh. And this one, is great for funding, like how to strategize uh, where you're gonna get your funding from. I've already um, recommended it in this webinar series before, but I'm just recommending it again. Let me know if you need these um, different resources. Um, but that is it. I see that there's a message. Okay. Oh, Veronica, gracias por venir. Um, and yeah, it's the last class, but we have more, <laughs> we have more coming, we have more incubators. So um, I will send out emails as we have the other workshops. The next workshop that we have is uh, for the Crossroads Tacoma Park program for um, next Saturday. So I'll send that out.
But thank you all very much. Mm -hmm.